Welcome to the Gathering Church Podcast. We pray that this message will encourage and empower you to be who God created you to be. For more information about our ministry, visit thegatheringmidland.com. We have in a series of messages entitled The Aftermath. And uh, I, I encourage you to just go and listen to it if you have not been able to be here. So that you can kind of like understand where we're going and, and what we've been through for the last few weeks. But uh, uh, pretty much we're talking about what's next. What now? What, what happens after, you know, after Jesus uh, died and then resurrected. And, and we're looking at how the disciples handle the, the aftermath of that. Uh, the, the, the life of Jesus. And um, the exciting thing about all this thing is that the, the story is not over. Uh, I think we're still making history today. We're still making history by, by believing in Jesus, by, by gathering together and worshiping Jesus, the Jesus that died over 2,000 years ago. We're still making history today. You are making history today by believing in him, by coming here, by worshiping, or maybe someone just brought you here. You are still making history because I believe that the word will always produce fruit. So even if you're here not wanting to hear God, God will speak to you. And God will start to change your life and, and, and transform your life if you allow him to work in your life. But uh, uh, we saw a few weeks ago that, that God is, is calling us to not be afraid. To, to, to look for him in the right places and not, not, not look for him in the wrong places. Just like the disciples, they were trying to find Jesus inside the tomb and he was not there. And sometimes we try to find Jesus in the places where he's not at. And... Uh, uh, the, the other thing that we, that we learn is that God will speak through us. He will use you after you find him to go and tell others about him. And uh, it's not over. You, you, you still have a history to make. You still have hope. You still have a future. And uh, the last thing that we saw a few weeks ago is that, that the enemy will try to discourage us. He will try to discourage you from moving forward, from coming to church. Not that church changes you. A relationship with Christ changes you. But it's manifested through the gathering with other believers. We encourage one another. We pray for one another. We, we care for one another. And uh, the good news is that Jesus is alive. He lives forever. He is alive and he lives inside of our hearts. And uh, he has given us all we need to fulfill uh, our purpose in him. And uh, today, today I, I want to talk about the wait, kind of like the video that we, that we saw. The wait, uh, waiting, waiting is not easy. And uh, last week I emphasized the importance of prayer. And, and I'll mention it again in, in today's message. But for now, let me just, just uh, take you through some things about waiting uh, who likes waiting? Who can raise your hand and you, you can say, I really like wait. I mean, I, I really like just waiting for things to happen. Just sit down and wait for things. Um, it, it's kind of a, of a struggle to wait for something. I, I remember not too long ago when I was coming back from a trip and I had to travel overnight because the, the, the flight would take about eight hours uh, to get to Dallas. And then from Dallas, I had to fly here. So uh, I remember that they dropped me off at the, at the airport, like around 11 p.m. in the night. And I knew that my flight was scheduled to depart at around 12 or 1, something like that. So I was already prepared to wait. I mean, I, I, I made a conscious decision to not get impatient and to just wait for the trip to get over, to be over. And I remember that I traveled the whole night and I got to Dallas at 8 a.m. in the morning. And if you know the Dallas airport is one of the, the largest ones that we have, it's, it's huge. I mean, you have to, to, to move from one terminal to another. You, you, you have to get pretty much a ride to, to get there. You cannot walk. So uh, the bad thing is that I had to wait four hours for my next flight after I got to Dallas, after flying eight hours. But I was prepared. I mean, I was like... I'm just going to wait patiently. I'm not going to stress about it. So uh, I got out of the plane in Dallas. I made my long walk to, to find the terminal. I look at the screens and found the terminal that I had to, to go to. And I grabbed the bite. And, and then I thought, well, since the day before, I thought, since I'm going to be four hours there, I'm just going to find my terminal, sit down, wait, and work in my computer. Because it was a Saturday and I was trying to get here on, for, for Sunday's service. So I sat down, yeah, I grabbed my headphones and 
And I was just waiting patiently. I was, I was so patient. I mean, I was relaxed because was, I was in the terminal waiting. And, and, I mean, just time just went like that. And, and suddenly I, I could barely hear, like, Jorge Romero, Jorge Romero, this is your last call. You have five minutes to get to the terminal. You have five minutes to get to the terminal. And I could hear, like, far away that they were calling my name. I was like, man, is there another Jorge Romero here? And suddenly I look around and no one was boarding the plane where I was sitting down. Apparently I was in the wrong terminal or they changed it. Some, I don't know what happened, but I swear that I have never run faster in the last 10 years like that day. Uh, so I barely made it. I was the last one in the plane. But, uh, you know, waiting. Waiting is, uh, is not really that fun. And uh, waiting is part of our everyday life. I mean, you go to the post office, you have to wait, especially you go on a Saturday morning, and you, you're just going to drop one letter that you don't have a stamp for. Now they have the computers and all that, but you have to wait. You get the point. The bank, I mean, to get your own money, you have to go to the bank and wait for your money to be available. Or, or I mean, just waiting. You deposit a check, you know, it's going to take three days for it to, I mean, you know. Uh, the other day, I, I had, a, I had a, a separate checking account that I never used, and I just went to close, and I thought, eh, I have like 30 minutes. Let's just go in and tell them that I don't want the account, that they can close it. Man, I had to wait, and then I had to come back, and it's just waiting is not easy. Uh, what about uh, the emergency room? I mean, urgent care, it's, it's really an emergency, but you have to wait. Uh, there's a pizza place in St. Uh, Paul Island. I was reading about it. And they say that if you order a pizza, it takes three days to get it delivered to your door. Uh, and we complain about 45 minutes for our pizza here, though. But, uh, and, of course, you wait at the airport, too. Um, but who likes waiting? No one likes waiting. There is a time for everything. The Bible which is a book that is the greatest book of all times. Sometimes we see the Bible as a, just a religious book full of rules and regulations about God and about uh, the divine creator. Uh, well, in, in this book, which if, if you're not familiar with the Bible, I encourage you to read it. it it's not just a book. It's, it's an amazing compilation of different authors' writings, ancient writings. It has about 40 authors they all wrote the Bible in, in, a, in a period of time of 1,500 years. And it all makes sense. It all comes together. It all points to Jesus. How crazy is that? Well, in this book, in the Bible, uh, a king, uh, the wisest king in the Bible, Solomon, he wrote, There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. Uh, there is a time for everything and pretty much everything in our world takes time. Everything, just, just look around. Everything that you see took time to become, to be. Everything that you're planning will take time. Anything that you have accomplished has taken some time. Time, time. Uh, now, if, if there is a time for everything, that means that we have to wait for some things to happen. So what I'm, I want to stress today is the importance of waiting, the importance of time, because time if we see what, what he's saying here, time matters. Time matters not only for us and for God, but, 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 but for life to happen, for things to become. Uh, whether we want to admit it or not, time matters. Time is really important. What we do with our time really, really matters. Uh, the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 says... Be careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Now, the King James Version, uh, the King James Version is a translation that's word for word. So the words that you find in the King James Version pretty much come from the original Greek, which is the New Testament. Uh, but uh, the King James Version says, redeeming the time. And that word redeeming is a very interesting word because... It pretty much means to buy up or to ransom or to rescue from loss. It, it, it means to pretty much to improve an opportunity. So what, what I was, when I was reading, I was like, wow, can we, can we actually get the best out of our time? 
to, to the point that we're actually rescuing time? I mean, can you really rescue time? Because we hear a lot of, oh, I wasted time. I've been wasting too much time. I wasted time the other day at the store or whatever. But, but here he says, make the best, be wise and redeem the time. Rescue it, ransom the time. Make the time that you think you have lost count. And it is clear that for God, time matters. Noah, for example, he waited 120 years for the rain. Abraham, he waited 99 years for the son of the promise. What about Moses, 40 years in the desert? Or Joseph that had dreams about the promise for him and he had to wait. He had to be a slave. He, he patiently had to wait. David, he waited for years to become the king after he was anointed to be king. Um, waiting pretty much is a lifestyle. The, in our story, in our central story about, about the disciples in the aftermath, after Jesus was crucified and then he resurrected, they're given a promise. I mean, Jesus appears to them and, tell them, and tells them, you know what, do not be afraid. Uh, just go back to Jerusalem and wait for the promise. They are given a very specific promise, but they are not told exactly how they should wait. They are just told to wait. And the disciples um, go back to Jerusalem, get in a room. Uh, it, the Bible says that it was about 120. Some other believe that it was just the disciples and then some other people around. Regardless, we, we see that they waited patiently for the promise. It pretty much became their lifestyle. I mean, think about it. They didn't know that it was going to take 40 days to, for them to receive the promise. They were just told, go and wait. What do you do when, the, when they tell you to wait? You, you kind of like develop a, like in my case, I knew how long I was supposed to wait for my next flight. I had it measured, but I, I lost track of time. But I knew that it was a certain time when I was supposed to get to the next plane. They didn't know. They were just told to wait. Just go and wait for the promise. It became their lifestyle. And the way I see it is that uh, we are all waiting for something. We all live in a, in a, in a way that, that we're always expecting something. So maybe my question for you today is what are you waiting for? Because we are all waiting for something. Maybe waiting doesn't, doesn't really make you think about, well, I'm, I'm, I'm really not waiting. Well, why did we change the, the word wait for hope? I mean, just instead of waiting, think about hoping. What are you hoping for? What are you hoping for today? A better future, a better house, the next car, or a better job, or a, a spouse, or better children, even though you're stuck with the ones you have? Uh, what are you hoping for? Because we're all waiting for something. We are all hoping for something. We all have a hope for the future. And, and what, what I want us to learn today is that the disciples, they didn't waste any time at all. They were told to go and wait. But they didn't just went there, sat down and waited. There are some specific things that they did that I hope that we can learn today from them. Because... Believe me, we are all waiting for something. And when you think about it that way, when you think that, that you really are waiting for, for, for something better, sometimes we just sit down and wait for things to change and we don't do anything while we're waiting to make those things happen. So the first thing that I, I want to, to talk to you or remind you, because we talk about it very often in this church, is about prayer. The first thing that I see the disciples did was they prayed as they waited. I don't want to repeat too much the prayer, but I think I, I can never repeat it enough. Because every Bible-believing Christian should have a prayer life. Not only in church, but even outside the church. Uh, we, you know, we, sometimes for, for us uh, that, that work in the church, sometimes it's hard to slow down because you feel like since you're working in the church, you don't really need to pray that much because you're praying while you're doing things in church. And it's not that way. Uh, for, for example, we come here at 9 on Sundays and pray. And, and you have no idea how hard it is for me to not open my outline 
for those 30 minutes that we have designated for prayer. You have no idea how hard it is for me to make sure that, that we have the AC units on, that, that the screens are going to work, that the entrance, that the greeters, that who is going to be here, who is not going to be here, who is not going to make it. For those 30 minutes, I have made myself just, 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 I have made a decision to say, for those 30 minutes, I'm not going to be concerned about anything but your presence, Lord. And I just come here, and, and, and we all have the same attitude. Be, we come and just pray and just ask the Lord to do what he has to do. Uh, that's why, like, right now we had some difficulties with the, with, the, with the video. The sound didn't come out. You know, before I would have been so bothered and so uh, angry, which I am. You, you, I'm just kidding. Um, but now it's, it's just, it doesn't matter. I mean, you can rewind it and replay it. Besides, I mean, well, I better not. Um, prayer is so important. Prayer is so important because sometimes we're so concerned about things around us. And yes, I mean, we, we are good persons. We love God. We love the church. We, we enjoy being in the church. We enjoy serving. But, but, but suddenly there are some specific times when, when you are confronted with the reality that you don't have a relationship with Christ through prayer the way he wants you to have it. So prayer is important. Uh, in Luke chapter 11, uh, verse 8, it says that Jesus was asked to teach the disciples how to pray. They came and say, Lord, teach us how to pray. And, and you can read that story. But, but after he teaches them how to pray, he, uh, he tells the Jesus tells them, suppose that you go to a friend's house in the midnight and you ask him for help. You can read the story. It's, it's, it's crazy how Jesus puts little things that we don't pay attention to many times. We just focus on the prayer. And you'll see, you, you'll see what I'm meaning about this because you know the end of this verse. You know it very well because we like to brag about it. We like to, to talk about it. But we don't pay attention to the detail. He says, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity. It's Luke 11, verse 8. Because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. In other words, Jesus is saying, keep on praying. Keep on insisting. If you pray for one thing one day, it doesn't mean that if I don't answer, you have to stop praying about it. You keep on praying. And that's what the disciples did for those 40 days. They constantly were gathered in prayer. And you know the last verses of this is, is verse number 9. It says, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds and the one who knocks, the door will be open. As we wait, as we are waiting, and like I said, we are all waiting for something. And at the end, you know what we're waiting for. But as we wait, we should never give up on prayer. I mentioned this last week, but the disciples were promised something. They, they were told, go and wait for the promise. They could have just waited there without praying. Why did they have to pray? If the promise was already made. God has promised you a lot of things. The, the, the Bible is full of promises. It says, if you follow me, blessings will follow you. If you, if you give, uh, I will give you. If you forgive, I will forgive you. If, 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 if you do what I'm telling you to do, my promises will follow you on my time. And, and, and the disciples, they just waited, but they didn't waste time. They prayed constantly. And, and this is where I was getting at. Uh, uh, Billy Graham, one of the greatest evangelists of all times, he says, heaven is full of answers. No one ever bothered to ask. God's answer is ready. It's just waiting for our personal and persistent prayer. Prayer is very, extremely, super important in the life of every believer. God promises to answer when we call upon his name, but he doesn't tell us when he will answer. But I assure you that as we remain consistent in our prayers, he will answer at the best time. Because he knows, he knows what is good for you. His plans are for good. He will fulfill his promises. And, and, and the disciples, 
they remained. It says in Acts chapter 1 verse 14 that they all joined together constantly in prayer. They were constantly in prayer. Constantly in prayer. Where uh, as churches uh, grow, sometimes we get, we get sidetracked and do, we forget our real purpose. And we forget our real goal. And, and, it, and it's, uh, growth is great, but healthy growth is better. And I believe that we make a better impact in, 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 in our town, in our city, in our, in our world when we take the church outside of these four walls. I would rather have two services here, but know that we have the gathering out there, reaching out, praying for people out there at the workplace, sharing Christ, sharing the love, giving to the needy, being light, than have you here seven nights a week and never touch anyone outside our four walls. Prayer is important. They all join together constantly in prayer. Not only we must pray earnestly, we must also listen. Don't we in any relationship, are, uh, we, we're always want, we always want to be listened. Uh, marriage, for example, of course, women talk a lot more than we do, but um, uh, we want to be listened to. I mean, we can lie about it. Men can lie about it. They can pretend that they don't want to be listened, but we want to be listened sometimes. And you women, you, you, you want to be listened. You, you don't want to just hear how our day went, even though our, 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 our way of explaining things are shorter. But, but you, you want to talk and you want to be listened. Uh, it, it's, it's the same with God. Sometimes we just want to talk to him and talk to him and talk to him and talk to him. And we never listen. And the problem is that I believe that many times we want to listen to him in a very uh, mystic form. Not in a way that he already spoke. What I'm trying to say is that he already said a lot of things that sometimes we're not listening because we don't take the time to open God's word and listen to his word. His word speaks. His word is alive. And uh, when, when, when God speaks, I found this quote, when God speaks, faith has to connect to his word. Because if you allow only your feelings to connect, no root can be formed. This is, this is important because now in our day, it's, we are, we are crowded with a lot of false teachings and beliefs and and, and, and false religion and meditation and, 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 you know, ancient religions that talk about a, a mystic, mysticism. And sometimes we bring that same uh, kind of belief to the Christian church. We think, uh, we think uh, I was sharing with some friends last night. I, I, I heard a, a preacher not too long ago stand up on the stage to preach, about to preach. And he said, he said, I'm so glad that I have the Holy Spirit because I don't really have to study the word that much anymore. Because he reveals things to me. And I just have to follow his direction. Church, that's dangerous. Because he already spoke. His word is alive. Uh, that's, that's why every, when the weekend is getting closer for me, it's a challenge. It's, it's a, you know, I get, I get good stress. I enjoy it. Because I don't want to speak my words. I want to speak his word. I want to speak what he says. Because he, my job is not, is not to tell you something new. It's, it's simply to, to tell you what, I already, what he already said in a form that you can relate to and that you can understand. God promises to answer, but we have to listen to his voice too. Ephesians chapter 6 talks about the spiritual weapons. It says, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit. The sword of the Spirit. Now we spiritualize things way too much sometimes to the point where we neglect the Word of God. But it clearly says, the sword of the Spirit, which is the what? What's the sword of the Spirit? The Word of God. And pray in the Spirit in all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. So if you pray in the Spirit, you are praying God's Word, right? Now I'm not, I'm not telling you to repeat God's Word as a prayer, but... The more you read, the more you listen to his voice, the more your prayers are going to align with what he wants for you. So that's why we have to pray consistently. Because the more we pray, sometimes he doesn't answer because he's changing us before he can give us what he wants for us. Sometimes he just remains quiet because if he would answer, it would hurt us. 
It's kind of like when he took the, the, the Israelites out of Egypt. If you read the story, it says that God took them through another way because if he would take them to the, through the path that they thought it was the best, they would be tempted that they would go back and worship idols and go back to slavery. Sometimes God takes you through the longer path and you have to wait. And as you wait, you have to pray. And as you pray, you have to listen. Because if not, if you're not listening when you, when you pray, you are praying your prayers. And he wants you to pray his prayers. He wants you to wait patiently on him, his way. So the disciples are suddenly sent to wait. They pray constantly, but notice how they go to the word of God. And this is, this is a, a very short uh, part of, of uh, Acts chapter 1 in verse 20. Um, I, I, I believe, like I said before, that, that you don't need to know everything about God to believe. What you know now is enough. If you remember, I told you last week or the week before, uh, we were reading in, in one of the Gospels when, when, when they went to the tomb and they saw that Jesus was not there anymore. It says there that, that until that day, the disciples, they really... Uh, didn't understand that Jesus had to be resurrected according to scripture. In other words, they didn't know everything and everything about the word of God, but they followed Jesus by faith. Now we get to, to, to this part of, of, of the story and they are sent out to wait. So they start praying, but they didn't, like I said, they just, they don't just pray. They, they listen to God's word. And how did they listen to God's word? They went back to the word of God. You see Peter quoting the book of Psalms in verse 20. It says uh, that, that uh, it says, for, said Peter, it is written in the book of Psalms, may his place be, be deserted. Uh, let there be no one to dwell in it. They're talking about Judas. Judas was the one that betrayed Jesus. And after he died, it's crazy that it was written before in the book of Psalms. But the disciples wouldn't have known if they wouldn't have opened the scrolls to find out what to do about it. So they went back. As they were praying constantly, they went back to the word of God. They find that, oh man, God already knew that, that we were going to need to replace Judas. And it says that he quotes the book of Psalms. May another take his place of leadership. And a few verses after that, you, you see that they immediately did something about it. After they read the word. What if they didn't, what if they hadn't opened the word of God and they just had uh, kept praying and praying and saying and speaking and waiting for the promise? Yes, praying, very, very spiritual, very spirit filled disciples waiting for the promise, just praying all the time, praying all the time, but never listening to God's word. They would have missed out on a very specific command that God gave them. Uh, maybe in, in your personal life, you, you, you want God to speak to you. Maybe you are waiting for the next big, uh, I don't know, speaker to come or preacher to come or turn the radio or the internet or whatever. And you want to spiritualize it. And maybe you, you're trying to have a prayer life, but you never open God's word. How else are we going to listen? God speaks through his word. To this day, he speaks through his word. To, through his word. And uh, uh, it's crazy that, that Peter... Apparently, they hadn't read that part before because if they had read that before, they, they would have known what to do without having to go back to the scrolls. You don't have to know everything about God to pray, to believe, to entrust Him your life. You don't have to, be, to, to know everything about God to start opening your Bible. Start where you are. God wants to speak to you. But the, the last thing that they did, they acted on what they heard. Last thing that I want to encourage you is act on what you hear. Jesus always, he always allowed those with him to do what they could do before he made an intervention. We may pray, we may be listening, but without action, we may be waiting longer than we should. The best way to wait is waiting God's way. For example, and I always bring up forgiveness because forgiveness is one of the biggest struggles for every human being, even for pastors, even for ministers. Forgiveness is hard. Forgiveness is tough because it breaks you down. Sometimes you have to ask for it when you were not even guilty. I mean, Jesus had to die when he didn't even 
commit any sin. Jesus had to be crucified and mocked. I don't know if you have read that passage, but in Isaiah, it says that, that, you could, that people couldn't even recognize Jesus because of the punishment that was put on him. We, we get amazed at the Passion of the Christ movie, which is a great movie, but I don't think it's even close to the reality of the suffering that Jesus had to go through. It clearly says that, that he was disfigured. I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't even tell that it was a human being on the cross because of the punishment. And he wasn't guilty, but yet he showed us how to forgive. And we humans are so prideful that we sometimes don't want to forgive. We don't want to let it go. We, we, we hold on to it. And God says, you know, I love you. I'm with you. I, I'm not letting you go. But, but if you want to experience freedom, true freedom, you have to do what I'm telling you to do. You have to trust me with everything you are. And I'm using forgiveness, but it may be another thing. It may be, it may be a hidden sin that you can get rid of. It may be pornography. It may be uh, lust. It may be uh, gossip. It may be cursing. I don't know. You know your struggle. I know my struggles. Act on what you hear. We may pray, we may be listening, but without action, we are literally wasting time. That's why I'm talking about time, waiting, waiting. How do you wait? Israel, the Israelites, the people of Israel, they, they were supposed to get to their destination in a few days, to the promised land. Instead, it took them years, 40 years in the desert. It was not God's will. It was not God's plan to last that long. They turned to idols. They started to gossip. They started to uh, complain. They were complainers. I mean, have you heard any complaints? I mean, sometimes we complain about everything and anything. And I mean, I'm not talking about losing salvation. You may still go to heaven, but you wasted time here to enjoy blessings that were for you here and now. Because of not acting on what you already know. My, my point is that we all, everybody... Uh, it, Romans chapter 1 says that, that no one is without, with, with excuse to say, I never knew about a God because creation speaks itself about a, about a mighty God. But, but we, all, we all know enough to put action. And we all are guilty of not putting action on things that we already know. Jesus always allowed those with him to do what they could before he made an intervention. For example, you remember when, when Jesus turned the water into wine? Man had to first fill the water pots. I mean, couldn't Jesus just do the whole miracle complete and without man doing anything? Yes, he could, but he always allows us to do our part. Uh, when the apostles catch a, a huge amount of fish, they had to throw their nets. I mean, I, I, Jesus could have just made the fish jump into the boat without even casting nets. Couldn't he? He could. I mean, he created everything and anything we see. Why, why can't he just do my miracle the way I want it now? When Jesus resurrected Lazarus, I, I, I love this story because he made the people move the rock. Come on, Jesus. Can you, I mean, you are, you're, you're about to bring him from death to life. Can, cannot, can't you just tell the rock to move and it will move? Yes, I can, but. You have to do your part so I can do mine. God wants us to do our best. And I promise that he will do the rest the best time, at the best time. But we have to wait. Do we struggle with waiting? We do. We all do. We all, in the waiting process, we, 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 we struggle. We struggle. And we need to learn how to wait, praying, listening, and acting on what, on what we already know. Let's just wait God's way. We all have struggles. Whatever struggle that you're going through, God can handle it. Just wait on Him. It will either break you or, or it will become a breakthrough for you. But God knows the best time for that to happen in your life. And God wants to give you what you need. He is faithful. You know, you may be sitting down there and, and you may think, you know, I don't, I mean, I, I have it made. I mean, I, I'm not really waiting for anything. I, I mean, I've got my family, I got my job, I got stability. I mean, I'm not really waiting for anything. Why, why should I have to?
pray and listen to God's word. If, I, if I'm fine, I mean, I have what I need. Or, or why should I do what he's telling me to do if, if I haven't done it and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good? Well, the reality is, like I told you, is that we are all waiting for something. We are all waiting for something. In this passage of scripture, when, when the disciples are told to go and wait, they're waiting for a specific promise for their time. But before that, when they saw Jesus go into heaven, uh, the angels told them something that, that, that is still a promise to be fulfilled. And that everybody, anybody, regardless of, of their belief, we are all waiting for it because it will happen. Uh, in verse number 10 of Acts chapter 1, it says, They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, he will come back in the same way you have seen him going to heaven. We are all waiting for something. Jesus will come back. He is coming back. And regardless of the promise of your momentary, momentary promise that you are waiting for right now, you should be in expectancy of that promise. Because He is coming back and He wants to find you ready. Because He wants you to live with Him forever. And in the process, He wants to bless you as you wait. As you wait His way. As you pray His way. As you listen to His word. And as you do what He wants you to do. Jesus will come back. So my question again is, I ask you here, this at the middle of the, of, the, of the message. What are you waiting for? I'm going to ask Raul to come. We're about to close. What are you waiting for? And just think about it. What are you waiting for? What breakthrough do you need? Do you need a new car? Do you need a new home? Do you need a new career? Do you, need, do, you, do you just need things to change and get better? And you're just, you know, dragging your feet every day, hoping that things will get better. We're all waiting for something. The problem is not if we're waiting or not. The problem is how are we waiting? You need to make prayer a priority. You need to make God's word a priority. You need to do what he tells you to do. What you know right now is enough. I'm not asking you to go overboard and try to do things that you don't even understand. I'm, I'm telling you, do what you understand. The Bible is not complicated. The gospel is not complicated. God's love is not complicated. He makes things easy to understand. You, you read the parables and, and they're not complicating. I mean, sheep, a coin, a prodigal son. I mean, how hard it is to understand that we were lost And he came to find us. How hard it is to understand that we were lost. And that in his hands we have value like that coin. How hard it is to understand that even if we run away. Or if we, if we see someone run away from God. It is our job to go and bring them back to the family of Jesus Christ. What are you waiting for? Or what are you hoping for? I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. We're just going to pray. And then we're going to sing one last song. And then we'll be dismissed. But I want to ask you, what are you waiting for? Give him your everything today. He's got it. He wins. At the end, all those found in him will have the ultimate victory. And while we wait, we are promised abundant blessings, joy, peace, healing. In Christ alone, we find hope. If today you need to fix the way you have been waiting for a breakthrough, this is your time. Lord, I pray that if anyone here, Lord, just needs a breakthrough, Lord, that is hoping for something better in whatever area of life. Lord, that you not give them what they need, but teach them what they need to do right now. Bring them back to you, Lord, to a relationship with you. Open up the scriptures to them, Lord, and reveal things that, hey, that probably they have never understood before, Lord. But because of their willingness to seek your face, Lord, they will get it this time. And Lord, give them the boldness, Lord, to act on what they already know. To put action, Lord, into what they already know that they are called to do. Lord, I pray for freedom, Lord, of oppression. Depression, Lord. Lord, I pray that if anyone here feels without value, Lord, that you show them how much you love them once again, Lord. And just wrap them, Lord, in your arms. In your arms of love. Thank you for listening to the Gathering Church Podcast. 
For more information about our ministry, visit thegatheringmidland.com.